Okay, well, welcome, everybody, on this Saturday morning. Uh, thanks for participating in this. And I am grateful to Bill and Barbara for having Lauren and I uh, come speak with you uh, this morning. It's an honor and a privilege to, to be here. Um, so my name is Ian Lupker, and my, the, the purpose of this morning's webinar is threefold. I wanted to introduce uh, myself and Lauren uh, to talk a little bit about Homeopaths Without Borders, this wonderful nonprofit that we're part of, and to introduce my, uh, the course, uh, the three-session course that I'll be teaching March, April, and May of this coming year on, on treating autism spectrum uh, homeopathically. And um, so I am um, going to you know, say a little bit about myself and, and, uh, and where I've come from and where I am now. I, um, I, I was almost scripted to go into medicine. Um, my father is a medical doctor. He's a cardiologist. I've got two uncles who are medical doctors. My aunt went to medical school at 48 and became a psychiatrist, um, medical doctor, and my grandfather was a, a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, medical doctor, who worked at the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas in the 50s, uh, which was really sort of the foremost psychoanalytic uh, center in the United States during that time. Uh, so I, I don't fall far from the tree, other than I took a hard left, after traveling in India for a year and decided I wanted to do naturopathy and homeopathy and not conventional medicine. And um, started NCNM, uh, which is now called the National University of, of Natural Medicine instead of the, Na the National College of Naturopathic Medicine in 98. And uh, was what my classmates referred to as a homeo head. <laughs> meaning I was really somewhat, to, to take from the autism diagnostic criteria, I was somewhat perseverative and fixated on homeopathy during those four years and, and really took all the, the uh, homeopathy courses I could, all the electives, and preceptored as much as possible with local homeopaths in the Portland area. I, um, one of the most formative uh, experiences during my education uh, between 98 and 2002, the four years I was in school, was organizing a, uh, a trip to Mumbai, uh, India, to, to work and preceptor in a homeopathic hospital there called Sri Mambadevi. And that was just a phenomenal experience. And that, I wanted to weave this in a little bit, and this is one of the themes that Lauren and I are going to talk about. I, I really want to emphasize how, how valuable having a clinical experience like this was and how formative that was for me. Uh, we were seeing 30 to 50 patients a day in this homeopathic hospital, and it really, the range of pathology that we were seeing um, and treating successfully was was just completely inspiring to me. I I left that eight week uh, rotation feeling like wow, homeopathy is able to do a lot more than what we typically see in an outpatient clinic here in the United States. And I I I think that the uh, what HWB Homeopaths Without Borders is doing in in uh, Haiti is probably similar, that there's a wider range of pathology and distunement that's being treated there. Um, so that experience was really, we saw everything from leprosy being treated with homeopathy to we saw a, a, a cobra bite uh, case, which um, if there's time I could share with you, um, the, the photographs and the images are a little bit, this guy was bitten by a cobra bite on the dorsum of his hand and uh, developed some necrotizing cellulitis. So the photographs attached to this presentation are a bit gory and I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna show it, it's, it, uh, it's not uh, breakfast time kind of visuals. <laughs> um, so I graduated in 2002 uh, from NCNM 
and was really fortunate to be offered a job up in Washington with Bob and Judith Reichenberg Ullman, and who had been in practice for 25 years at that point. And I joined their practice as an associate. And we, um, we co-authored um, this book, A Drug-Free Approach to Asperger's Syndrome and Autism. And of course, Asperger's syndrome now is not a diagnosis that's used. In the DSM-5, uh, it was removed, and now autism is spoken of as, as or diagnosed as simply autism spectrum disorder. But I spent uh, uh, four years with them. Um, I would sit in one day a week, uh, observing their cases. Uh, we would consult on my cases and my early difficult cases, and and so I did a, a residency and internship is the way that I look at it. So I spent four years seeing hundreds of, of autism cases. And after our book came out, um, you know, those numbers and, the, and the, the, the children with autism that we were treating, um, that really became the central uh, focus of my practice um, and has remained uh, so over the last, um, coming up on 17 years. My, uh, my practice has expanded a little bit. I, I do, it's primarily homeopathy, um, but I also have been getting in more into functional medicine um, and become really interested in the field of palliative medicine and uh, did a nine month course and, and working with people at the end of life and how to support people during chronic disease. Um, and part of that is uh, the functional medicine aspect is I, I work with a medical doctor here in the clinic and we are working with the Bredesen protocol for Alzheimer's treatment and prevention. And, you know, it's interesting, um, these neurological conditions, both Alzheimer's disease and autism, there are some similar causes and conditions uh, that give rise to these chronic illnesses. And, you know, that's the other aspect of, of, of being a naturopath, that I'm, I, I'm using homeopathy as the, as the central uh, treatment um, focus, but I'm also recognizing that nutrition is really important and providing the body with the causes and conditions so that the homeopathic remedy can really uh, be optimized in its usefulness in, in helping people um, and so diminishing brain inflammation, uh, working with the gut, um, all of the, you know, those two things in particular are really important to working both with autism and with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so in, uh, in 2008, um, I was invited to be on the board of, uh, the Homeopathic Academy of Naturopathic Physicians. And... A couple years later, um, I was president and was president for six years of that organization, became treasurer for a couple years, and recently just stepped down after a decade of, of working on that board. And they're still doing a lot of really good work, um, trying to shore up the homeopathic programs and naturopathic schools in particular. Uh, it's a real focus of that organization. Uh, in 2013, uh, I was at the NCH conference, and Gene Hoagland approached me and invited me to be on the board of Homeopaths Without Borders. And I thought about it for about a second, and I thought this would saying no to Gene would be like saying no to my grandmother. <laughs> there was just no way that I was going to be able to. Uh, say no to this opportunity. And I've been on the board of Homeopaths Without Borders for the last, um, since 2013. And it's really, it's one of these boards that you look forward to the board meetings because the enthusiasm is contagious. The passion that the board members feel for the organization is contagious. And the work that we're doing in Haiti is phenomenal. Um, Holly and, and Lauren just got back from Haiti, and I'm sure Holly's going or uh, Lauren's going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, hearing the stories of of 
of both their trainings there and what they're treating there are really, really inspiring. Um, and so I, I, you know, again, it, it dovetails with, I, I want to emphasize that, you know, I think finding an experience like this, like being a volunteer and going to Haiti and working with an organization like Columbia Pass Without Borders, or uh, going to India and figuring out how to, how to make a preceptorship work in a hospital like that, where you're treating such a diversity of, of uh, pathology, um, is really an invaluable experience for a homeopath. Um, it has been for me. I strongly encourage it. And lastly, um, so March, April, and May, the second Saturdays, so March 9th, April 13th, and May 11th, second Saturdays of those months, at 10 o'clock Pacific time, um, I'm going to be doing a three-session uh, course on treating autism spectrum disorder. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've been preparing for this course um, and, and thinking that my focus, there, there are a couple things that I really want to focus on uh, during this three-session course. And, and one of them is, is on just how perfect a fit homeopathy is for this chronic condition. And some, some uh, people working in the autism field refer to it as a neurodevelopmental, psychiatric, de de uh, developmental, gastro um, gastrointestinal uh, uh, condition. And it affects every system in the body. Um, so it's neurology and it's gut and it's inflammation and it's metabolic. And... So it's, it really is a perfect fit for homeopathy that really in taking the totality of symptoms, we're thinking about the whole person. And, you know, it's not only the, the autistic child that we're thinking and about and considering, but it's also the family system. So, you know, my, my sense of holism has really broadened as my practice has developed over the years. And so it's one of these things where, you know, often I'll treat the child and then the mom will come to me. And if I can help the mom, the whole family gets better. And so it's this really systems approach to working with the family as well as the child. Um, and so I'm really going to be emphasizing um, that uh, the larger sense of holism and working with the family while working with the child. And the other, the other emphasis that I, I really like to make when I'm, I'm teaching is, is, uh, is Hahnemann's The Ninth Aphorism in the, organism, or in the Organon. Um, you know, the availing oneself, uh, this living instrument for the higher purposes of existence and really identifying what that is within the individual and what, what are we going for in terms of our treatment? What is the orientation? of what we're hoping this remedy is going to do for the patient and getting really clear on what, on what that is uh, for the individual themselves, what their subjective desires and definition of, of, of living, of being an instrument for their higher existence and for those purposes. Um, and it's, it's, and I, and palliative medicine has really influenced that perspective because understanding um, what a person uh, deems as quality of life at the end of life is really going to influence what kind of treatment interventions are used. Uh, but that, you know, for any chronic condition, I think that that principle is, is applicable. And, um, so yeah, I look forward to, to uh, teaching this, this three session course and I'm really, I'm gonna make it as case based as possible and really explore the different um, types of presentations that you'll often see uh, with the child with autism. Um, and there are a lot of comorbid diagnoses, uh, whether it's OCD, uh, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, um, but it's also, you know, there can be leaky gut um, and there can be other metabolic issues that are happening with the child that are important to keep in mind because 
you know, again, you know, we need to create the right nutrition. We need to support the gut because that's what's going to support the brain. And the remedy, a, a constitutional similima will always work better if those basic nutrient needs are met and uh, someone has the building blocks to create a healthy ecosystem in the gut and a healthy uh, cognitive um, neurology. And I think that's about it. I, um, you know, um, I've really, Homeopaths Without Borders has been, it's, it's been a real blessing to be able to be part of this organization. And, and again, it's, it's super, the enthusiasm on this board is like none other um, that I've experienced on a board. And it's really fun to be part of. Um, so, and again, I encourage any of you students who are interested in seeking this kind of clinical experience uh, where you're, you're seeing a broader range of pathology than you typically would in an outpatient clinic in, in the States, um, to go for it, to go to India, to go to Haiti, to volunteer with one of these organizations, and to, to really experience directly what, what homeopathy is capable of, of accomplishing. And so I'm going to pass the baton now to Lauren. And so if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll present this uh, Cobra bite case that I was talking about. But um, I'm also really interested, we're interested in hearing any questions that you might have. So now I'll, I'll Lauren Fox. Okay. Thank you, Ian. That was great. And um, I learned a lot about you just listening to you. That's great. Mm. So, um, so my name is Lauren Fox. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I uh, didn't come from a long line of healers um, in my lifetime, but I, it, there was no question that I was going to be some, in healthcare, some sort, right from the get-go. You know, everybody brought their dying dogs and cats and people and to me, always. So I, I became a nurse and then a nurse practitioner um, and knew right away that I didn't want to practice conventional medicine. Um, I, didn't want to, I didn't think they had a clue on how to really help people feel well. Um, so I uh, started searching very early on for something different and uh, homeopathy uh, came right up. To my face and I absorbed it like a sponge. Um, I did not have the, the privilege to go to an organized course um, like many of you are doing now. Um, however, I did learn from many masters and that's what I did as I spent time with many people from around uh, the United States and in Europe and um, absorbed everything and anything that I could. Um, I started um, a homeopathic uh, primary care family practice. Out of that, I started being asked to attend my patients' um, births. And um, I had had some experience with midwifery, but I was not um, a trained midwife, but I was asked to start attending births. I apprenticed with other community um, midwives, and I became the homeopathic component to that uh, process, and then quickly became a primary midwife. <laughs> so uh, I have attended in my um, short career, no, that's a very long career actually, um, over 300 births, home births, not hospital births, although I did have to transfer a few people. So that's, um, and then as a, a classical homeopath, I have used homeopathic medicine 100% um, pretty much from when I started practicing, which was almost 40 years ago. And I have worked in, um, I have had private practices and also have worked in integrated um, rural healthcare practices, which is just wonderful. You get to use every single skill um, possible. And it's, it's really um, been a wonderful experience for me. 
So when the opportunity, um, things changed in my personal life and I knew I needed to do something a little different, I started looking for some place to volunteer and travel. Um, and I, I hooked up with Homeopaths Without Borders. And little did I know that, you know, within a year and a half, I would be asked to be a consultant and eventually join the staff. Um, it wasn't in my my five-year plan, my three-year plan, but it was um, a blessing and it's been a blessing and has changed my life incredibly. So enough about me. Um, I'm going to um, now share my screen and um, I'm going to put on a, a PowerPoint um, which uh, it's just going to be a slideshow. It's going to keep going as I'm talking. And I, Holly and I picked out um, photographs uh, over the last that we've taken and other volunteers have taken over the last, um, it's going on nine years. And uh, they will depict um, beautiful scenery of Haiti. They will also depict things like uh, the devastation after Hurricane Matthew. Uh, you will see community clinics. You will see um, our North American volunteers uh, partnering and mentoring um, Haitian uh, students. And um, there, I, hopefully you will see what brings us back to Haiti all the time. Um, it, we do not refer to Haiti as the poorest uh, country in the Northern Hemisphere. We don't re regard them as a third world country. We, we call them a developing nation um, or a resource lacking country. So um, I'm going to start the slideshow, I hope. And <laughs> I'm going to go to the and. Um, if you have questions about any of the pictures later, you can ask me, but I'm not gonna stop the slideshow. I'm just gonna keep talking, okay? So, um, HWB, or Homeopaths Without Borders, uh, has the mission of teaching and treating. Basically, tr using homeopathy, teaching and treating where it is minimally or not available at all. That's purely our mission. It, uh, the conception of the organiz nonprofit organization was in 1998. There, um, there have initially for m many years, it was really about teaching. They went to Cuba, Honduras, Trinidad, Guatemala, the, and the Dominican Republic. And it was all about teaching um, in medical schools or in any kind of um, school that was interested in learning homeopathy or about homeopathy. It wasn't until 2010, after the devastating earthquake in um, Haiti, that a, a, a direct um, team, a team went to directly treat, okay? Um, and during that time, they were working Unbelievably so. I wasn't on those first couple of trips. I, I ended up going about six months after the, hard, uh, the earthquake. Um, but those first few trips were um, sleeping on floors and wherever they could, treating people on sidewalks, um, wherever there was devastation, they were. And they brought as much equipment in terms of bandages and um, you know, diapers and what you name it, uh, along with homeopathic um, medicines. And um, the team met uh, a young Haitian nurse uh, who said to the, this team, as uh, our team, HWB's team, as they were working alongside, what are you doing? It seems very interesting. And I want to know it. Can you teach it? Can you teach us? And um, they said yes. And that was the birth of our mission to fulfill the other part of our mission is to teach. 
So up to date, as of last week, there have been 32 service trips to Haiti, including two direct relief um, uh, trips right after, like within a week, week and a half after uh, Hurricane Matthew. So the current uh, HWB is run by um, a board of directors, all volunteers. Um, and Christy Lamp is the president. Laurie Stem is the vice president. Christine Fiodoris is secretary. Suzanne Smith is treasurer. Ian Lupner, who you have just met. Isabel Franco, Liz Breeden, and Holly Manugian is the executive director. And I am uh, the clinical director and educator um, for the organization. So we um, have been very busy uh, since uh, this young nurse uh, asked us to start teaching. And we have developed um, two courses uh, with um, associated curriculums. And both of those curriculums, which you just saw floating by on the slideshow, are available on our website. And the last slide will, will show you the website. Um, so to date, so we have two courses. One is we call affectionately the Fundamentals of Homeopathy. I like to think of it as a general medicine course or family practice because we teach um, a, a how to treat many uh, acute um, and conditions, common conditions that we have seen over the years in Haiti. And we are teaching, um, we started uh, teaching people like farmers, educators, uh, community leaders, and we are now teaching licensed uh, medical personnel. So to date, 34 homeopath communitaires um, have been educated in homeopathic family practice and 12 licensed medical personnel. The second course is called Fundamentals of Homeopathy for the Childbearing Year with its corresponding curriculum, which again is, is um, available through our website. Uh, there are seven active uh, femsage, who are female midwives who have been trained, and one homsage. Um, and currently, we have 11 uh, femsages, midwives, who are enrolled in the course. And that's, I just came back last week, we started a new cycle of the fundamentals of homeopathy and the fundamentals of, of for the childbearing year. We have a three-year plan with these courses. Um, the, the, both courses will, I, this, this cycle I started having teaching associates. Um, in the fundamentals course um, for general homeopathy, I have two um, teaching associates who have, one was trained, was in the very first class we ever taught. He's a pharmacist. And the second um, is a physician who we have partnered with over the years and finally was able to take the course this last cycle. They are going to be helping me teach the course over the next three years and eventually the course will be turned over to them to start teaching all around the country. Um, and I'm doing the same thing with the fundamentals for um, homeopathy for the childbearing year. And the one homsage that was um, uh, trained several years ago is my teaching associate um, at that time uh, for this course. And they are all crackerjack and I couldn't do it without them. They are just fabulous. Um, we also have developed and executed protocols for three epidemics. Um, and there's a chapter on epidemics in the fundamentals of homeopathy um, curriculum. The three epidemics, we have treated cholera, um, chikungunya, uh, which is a um, viral um, mosquito-borne illness, and Zika uh, in Haiti. So I thought I wanted, I, I wanted to 
share with you what I think it has been the reason why we've been so successful. Um, top, top of the list is certainly the people and the enthusiasm, which, uh, did that go away? It did. Can you see the, uh, that one? I want it to stay. Um, <clears throat> the enthusiasm of the people involved, the people who are not only on the board, but also who have come and volunteered and the people who have contributed, whether it be um, money or computers or books or medicines or air, air miles. Um, this organization is alive and well and thriving on a shoestring <laughs> budget. But so that's the first thing. But uh, I, I also um, contribute our successes to that we took time to develop relationships in Haiti. We took time to learn the culture and start to learn the culture because there's always more. There's always more to learn. Each and every trip, I, I feel more connected. I feel like I have a deeper understanding. And, um, you know, we, are, we see ourselves as visitors, as, as guests in this country. And um, we maintain that all the time. We never tell them we know how they should be doing this. Um, the second thing is that uh, we, right from the beginning when we started teaching, we taught the fundamentals, the foundational principles of classical homeopathy. And we incorporated clinical com the com clinical component simultaneously, right away. The first session that they, the students were in, they were also in clinic, um, observing and then very quickly starting to take cases <clears throat> with, with um, supervision, of course. And the third thing is um, that we, we started locally. We developed the programs with locals um, and speaking, saying basically that nurse that we first talked to. And then we went to community leaders who urged us to go to the Ministry of Health <clears throat> um, MSPP is the Ministry of Health and, and get, the, get them to understand what we were doing, who we are, um, and we did. And they, the ministry, urged us to then go and teach the professionals, the medical professionals. They wanted the courses immediately into the universities there. <clears throat> Um, but we chose to start teaching professionals, which is what we're doing. The most important part of this is that we allowed the Haitians to direct us, to tell us where to um, go, where to teach next, who, with whom we should partner, and where the resources were mostly needed. Always. They directed it. So... Um, what I'd like to extend to you all now is that, again, it's an organization totally volunteer-based. Um, we accept all levels of students and practitioners if they would like to join us on a, on a trip. Um, there's much to do. If you don't feel confident in being there and being, uh, you know, taking cases, you can help run the community clinics. You can practice um, alongside another more practice homeopath. Um, if you feel confident and are uh, willing and able to mentor the Haitian students, we need people to do that. We need people in, in behind the scenes with many skills. We need skills of bookkeeping, accounting, uh, social media, fundraising, um, development skills. Anything and everything. <clears throat> we probably can find a, a, something for you to do that will help the organization. So please don't hesitate to, to shout out and uh, get involved. So thank you very much. And I'm going to unshare, I think. Um, and then open it up for questions, I guess.
Hi, uh, I have a question about <laughs> Haiti and homeopaths without borders. Um, do you have volunteers of any age, older, younger? <laughs> yes. Older. Yes. Uh, yes. Hey, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, um, it is important. Yes, there's no age. Yeah. Um, it depends on the trip. It depends on what we're planning. Um, I, our accommodations are definitely habitable. Um, and I would encourage you, if you're interested, to speak to us more individually. But we do encourage people who are in good health. Um, yeah. Anybody that has a chronic illness or uh, anything that's going to limit them, um, it, it's important for you to think about and mm -hmm. be honest with yourself. Um, yeah. You know, during the hurricane, when we went for direct relief stuff, we slept on concrete floors. Mm -hmm. we had about two hours sleep. We had, mm -hmm. um, we shared a house and a, one shower and bath with probably 50 people. Mm -hmm. And you know, those kind of trips are not right for everybody. But mm -hmm. there's something, yes. So the answer is yes, but there may be some parameters around that yeah and the length of of of, of a usual not uh, volunteer that comes yeah time. we're we're limiting it to about a week now oh really um, that short yeah. yeah well we're finding that that's the best for most okay. people yeah and uh yeah it works best and it depends um on the trip what what the focus of the trip is and so forth and what you're your goal is to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we always um, we said we have people fill out the initial mm -hmm. interview on the website, and then we contact you, and then we set up a a, a Zoom meeting, mm -hmm. and that's a whole bunch of things. There's, there's lots of prep, lots and lots of preparation that goes into before you even would come, and then yeah. as you get into the information, more and more people self select out. I I'm in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um Another question. Okay. Are you in Haiti alone or are you other com countries as well? Right. Oh, um, right. At present, we're only in Haiti right now. Okay. It's yeah. a small organization. I yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah we, we don't have no people or anything. <laughs> but we have been asked to go to other places. Mm. Um, but we are committed to seeing this three year plan through. Um, I see. And then yeah. we're. Oh. Mm -hmm will happen then. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I should also add that you don't need to speak the language. Um, oh, right, yes. Yeah. Um, we have translators. Um, yeah. Work very closely with. Because they're mostly the indigenous language or the French as well? Uh, they're French and Creole. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excuse me, I want to emphasize something that um, Lauren said at the end of her presentation, and, and, I, and I was alluding to this in, in when I was talking about my experience in Mumbai and, and what happens in Haiti, but, you know, I, I, I remember coming back from that trip in 2001 in Mumbai and just and feeling a lot more confidence in my prescribing and what homeopathy was capable of. And, you know, that's, again, that's not something that I think you always get a sense of um, in, you know, treating in an outpatient clinic in the United States or in Europe. Um, just the, the, you know, the extremity of pathology and just seeing what homeopathy is capable of when it's really allowed to, to stretch its stride. Right. 
yeah. go for it. I, I, yeah, I mean, that was really a, a big, a, a pivotal thing for me to come back to the States and, and just recognize what homeopathy is capable of and have confidence in that. Absolutely. I, I keep hearing back um, from our volunteers that come um, that either are observing or actually um, prescribing themselves. And it, it is so clear, the medicine to be um, used is often so clear. And if you follow mm -hmm. our sort of what we've learned in, about the Haitian culture, but also the foundational principles, it's, it, I won't say it's easy, but it, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. treat um, people with gangrene. You can treat people with elephantiasis. Um, you don't have to get all, ah, how, what do I do? You just go back to the basics, back to, and it, people kept, after they spent time with us and then went back to their practices, they saw a dramatic difference in how they approached their cases at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, that's good. Um, I guess I'm getting some chat questions. Should I just say them out loud or should I just answer on the typing? Say them out loud. Okay, good. Um, well, the first one was that somebody had contacted us this week and should you wait? And I wrote back, yes, we're just getting our act together after being away for two weeks. So you'll be contacted next week. Um, and I, I, I knew there was somebody that had contacted us, but we, the, the major challenge is um, communication in Haiti. I mean, there are many challenges, but communication between each other in country and out of country. So um, we will be in touch with whoever um, is, is wanting information about the organization next week. Okay, and then the other, there was another question about mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, yes. Yeah, there is a concern, um, much less so in the, in the city um, where we're stationed right now, but there are mosquitoes. Um, the, uh, you know, the Zika and chikungunya um, viruses are not prevalent right now. So I think they probably affected as many Haitians as, as it's going to during this cycle. I do believe it'll come back again as history shows us. Um, malaria is always a concern. Typhoid and cholera are always a, a concern. But we, um, we will never eat food that has not um, been prepared properly for foreigners. We will never drink uh, water that is not, um, you know, bottled. Um, unless you sneak it <laughs> and I'm not watching you. <laughs> then we could have a problem. But, but there's all those opportunities, all those things are taken care of for you. When we are out in the countryside, things get a little more dicey and more difficult. Um, and that's where we are more selective on who we take and how many we take and make sure we have enough um, supplies for everybody. Um, malaria prevention, um, you know, we've had 32 trips. I would say there's probably been 32 ways of people deciding how to do malaria prevention. There are many protocols um, out there in the homeopathic world. There are herbal things. There are conventional medicines. Um, we don't tell you how to do that and what to do. It's your choice. Um, I'll answer more if there's anything else to say. What other concerns, other concerns to consider? Can you explain the logistics of travel? Um, not sure what that means, but in country, whoever wrote that, the logistics of travel. Um, so we generally, um, we used to try to meet in, in Florida and then go into the country by our, you know, to, all together. Sometimes that works out, sometimes not. Um, in the last couple of years, Holly and I have gone um, to Haiti a couple of days before volunteers come. 
So we don't escort you actually in. Um, so all that is, all those informational things will come up as we, you know, get into that. We fly into Port-au-Prince um, and we pick you up there. So, um, but it, it, I can't answer that it, um, directly in that it depends on who's coming, where they're coming from. These last couple of trips, we actually met people at the airport in Port-au-Prince, but they were given strict instructions on where to go and how to go. And it's, it's quite easy, you know, it's a little, um, some people come in together. There are a few flights that come directly from Boston or New York, but otherwise all the other flights from all over the country have to go to some place in Florida and then go to Puerto Rico. Maybe they want some coffee, but they all want to. Hey. Ian, do you want to show that case? I want to see it. <laughs> I really do want to see okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I, um, okay, I do want to give a little bit of a trigger warning because these pictures, this is a cobra bite case, so, and there's some serious cellulitis on this guy's hand, so I don't. Um, I don't know if you want to get ready to, uh, I don't know, cover your screen or something, but let's see here. I can bring this up. Okay. Let me see if I can share my, oh, just give me a second here. Let's see. All right, let me see if I can do this now. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, and I'm going to pull up this. Oh, that's odd. Okay. 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 Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's interesting. Okay. Um, this, these, we, my, my, my wife and I have goats on our farm, so I'm, I'm into goats. And this is a picture in India of um, some goats being carried on this horse. Okay. So here we go. This was a, a um, this was a 58 year old man who came in to see us. He was a missionary, um, and he presented with a with cellulitis um, on his hand. This is a covered in henna, but you can see, uh, you know, on the dorsum of his hand, uh, the cobra bit him. He was out cutting grass and. And the cobra bit him, and it, it swelled up into this uh, boil, uh, which was lanced, um, and then became uh, uh, cellulitis. And the infection um, looked like it was going systemic. He was, he was febrile. Here, let's, uh, let's see. Oops. Uh, the, he, he had become feverish and he was having some muscle weakness. He was having a facial palsy. Um, and, uh, he was recovering from these symptoms. Uh, then he went to a local hospital. He received three doses of anti-venom sera and anti-tetanus and some cortisol, um, some dexamethasone. And none of them were really helping them at all. He was still having a fever. Um, one of the most interesting things about, oh, why isn't it letting me? Yeah. <laughs> 
So this is probably the goriest of the pictures. But one of the most interesting presentations of this case was that this guy said that he felt when he was feeling pain or itching or any discomfort in his hand, it felt better under warm, hot water, huh. which was a little bit hard to believe. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I mean, just looking at this picture, is this a hand that you want to put under hot water? But this guy was definitely ameliorated by the hot water. And this was really the key to the case. Um, it was one of the, by far, the most strange and peculiar symptom uh, in his case. When he did have the boil, it swelled to a, a blue-purple color. It was lanced. It became infected. Uh, he was given... Uh, Lachesis, uh, some Nux vomica, and then Lachesis a second time, uh, higher potency, and with no effect. And then he came into the hospital to see, to see us. And um, so he came in, and he was a, he was a rather, <laughs> he was an interesting guy. He taught junior high students. Um, he had been bitten by two cobra snakes in the past. And uh, he came in, he was wearing a loose cotton shirt, tropical style. It was a loose collar. There were a lot of lachesis. Uh, there was a, uh, a lot of lachesis symptoms in his case. He, he was very, very, very loquacious, uh, quite loud, um, constantly moving, gesticulating, really, really restless. And, you know, he, I mean, it was a little bit interesting. I mean, often at, at this clinic in Mumbai, there would be patients out the door and people waiting, uh, 10, 15, 20 people waiting in the waiting room to be seen. And he would just kind of bud to the front of the line and um, make himself known. And so we took his case. Um, there was some purulent exudate from the, from the hand. Uh, it was whitish yellowish discharge. Um, he was markedly swollen. Uh, the pain was there. Um, and again, it was better with, with uh, putting a warm application on it. He was worse when he lowered his hand. Um, his hand was itchy and uh, had an aversion to smoking. He said, it makes my blood impure. Um, his thirst for water had increased. And uh, he craved spices, garlic, and pepper. So, and he liked his, his, his wound tightly wrapped with gauze. And so, you know, when we took his case, um, three remedies really, really came to our differential. Uh, Lactosis, which had already been given and, and uh, hadn't worked. Uh, Roost tox and apis. Mm. And we gave this guy Roost Tox mainly because, I mean, this is just a straight ahead, um, you know, homeopathic uh, indication of better with warm applications, which really was the sort of pivotal symptom in this case. And you can see his hand. This is actually just three weeks later, but his, his fever subsided, the pain subsided, uh, he continued on Roost Tox uh, 200C um, three times a week, and and he improved. And I was just, I mean, this this was really exciting to see that something this severe in terms of pathology that easily could have gone into a sepsis, um, a septic state, uh, that he he improved with Roost Tox 200C a few times a week. And, you know, this is really one of the, one of the cases that where I talk about, you know, coming back, uh, coming back to the States and having seen something like this treated successfully um, without uh, antibiotics, without, I mean, the, the, the steroids that they had given him really weren't effective, but, just that something like this is treatable with homeopathy uh, really uh, increased my confidence in what our medicine is capable of doing. And um, I hope so no one lost their stomach when looking at those slides. But um, anyway, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And it's, it, 
And the other reason I wanted to present that, that case is because it's really such a straightforward case. You know, what is most unique about the presentation of the person that you're, you're working with? And without using any kind of speculative theories or any, you know, pretty hypotheses, it is just matching the person's uh, totality of symptoms to the remedy and voila, you've got improvement. So I, I give this case in, in to sort of, um, you know, express that I, I uh, the way this is in some ways the way I practice now, it really for me comes down to the law of similars. And I'm really kind of a straight ahead, straight shooting homeopath in that regard, that I'm really just looking for what's strange, rare and peculiar, I'm looking for what's unique about the patient's presentation and using well done provings, I'm trying to match the remedy to the patient presentation. And it's that straightforward for me. And, and, you know, it, it, this is a bit, this is an acute case, obviously, and autism is, is more chronic and more complex, but, um, you know, I apply these principles to treating autism as well. You know, I'm, I'm really trying to get away from speculation in theory and really empirically just looking at what's in front of me and what's in our Materia Medica and matching those two things and getting good results in that, that manner. Great. Yeah. Are there any questions about any of that? Could I ask a question about you repeating the same dose? Yeah. The potency? Yeah. You know, it was, um, so we were, of course, dosing. We, we are waiting for, you know, the improvement to plateau or start to regress slightly. So, um, you know, we would give him 200C and he would improve, he would improve and improve and plateau. And then we were redosing. Uh, and we felt like the remedy it's had plateaued or that he had started to regress. So you're really, you know, you're giving the vital force just that um, enough of a nudge to kick in the vital force and to help the person heal, you know, not too much and not too little of the remedy, but really pacing the remedy and the dosing schedule based on the patient's need and, um, so yeah, we would just we were just tuned in, and this guy was coming back to the clinic. He lived nearby, so he was seen by by uh, by the doctors in the clinic, and so you know we figured out a dosing schedule based on his presentation and his trajectory of healing. So when he plateaued, you wouldn't increase the potency. No, because the two hundred C was working well with him. Yeah, I mean as long as that. When he plateaus and then we redose and the healing would resume, there was no need to go to a higher potency um, at that point. And I, you know, I'm pretty careful about that these days. I mean, I've, I've definitely been burned by going up the potency scale too quickly. And I become much more conservative in sticking with the potency that is working. Um, and as long as there's improvement, you know, the, the velocity of the, the, the healing isn't as important as the trajectory and making sure that we're on the right track. If it takes a little more time, um, you know, that's more important to me than, than messing up a case by pushing the vital force too much, which can, which can get you into trouble. So okay. I'm really yeah. wanting to avoid aggravations as much as possible. I don't, I don't think that they're necessary to heal. Actually, I think that's one of the, I mean, that's what I was taught early on in school that you really wanted to see an aggravation and that was really a good thing. Um, but it, always, it wasn't always such a great thing for the patient <laughs> you know, to aggravate. So I'm really trying to match the, the potency, you know, the least amount of, of force, the least amount of nudge to evoke the vital force's response. Um, yeah, not too much, not too little. So there's there's a real art to that. 
Yeah, because from what I'm reading in school right now, it's all about don't repeat the same dose, kind of alter it a little. But mm. then when I read a lot of cases mm. from current homeopaths, it seems like they do repeat doses. Mm. Yeah. So I guess I'm a little confused <laughs> as to... It's, you know, posology, and this is one of the most confusing things in homeopathy, and every homeopath does it differently. And I've, you know, honestly, I've almost come full circle with this. I mean, when I got out of school, I was doing dry doses, one dose, wait, two months. And then when I was working with Bob and Judith, I got much more into plussing remedies and doing, you know, uh, the C potencies in water and having them succuss in a one ounce dropper bottle and give, um, you know, seven drops, three drops, depending on what's going on. Um, but it, it really varied, and that gave me a lot more flexibility in kind of matching the person's vital force to how frequently I was dosing, how many succussions that they, I was asking them to, to give their medicine, and how many drops. So that's one thing that I like about, about using liquid remedies in that way, um, is that there's a lot more wiggle room in terms of matching uh, to what the patient's needing. Now, you know, in the last four or five years, I have come back. And so just to back up a second, you know, I was influenced by Luke de Shepard's work um, in not wanting to give dry doses over and over again. And I've definitely, you know, I have seen cases where, you know, people have gotten into trouble with that. And, and there's been proving symptoms that are happen, happening that eventually became pathology you know, with dosing dry doses over and over and over again. Um, you know, now um, I'm more conservative. I'm really looking for the minimal dose, with, uh, to use the minimal dose with somebody to evoke the greatest response in the vital force. But I'm, I'm trying to gauge how sensitive is the person, um, how clear is the remedy picture, how strong is their vital force, um, you know, and what has their past experience been with, with homeopathics and trying to, to gauge all those factors in determining whether I'm going to use a dry dose, whether I'm going to use an LM, whether I'm going to use a plus remedy, and how frequently. Um, so those, some of those decisions are, can get kind of complicated. Yes. Um, you know, it's a complex thing, and, it, 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 and experience helps. And learning from my mistakes help, helps a lot too. And I've definitely made mistakes with that and, and been burned and learned the hard way. Um, but ultimately, and I think, it's, I think it's aphorism 79, but we're really, you know, we're really shooting for matching the, the person with the least amount of um, a nudge to... Um, to evoke their vital response. And I don't want to give too much. I don't want to give too little. I want to give just, just the right amount. Um, but some of that, there's no rote approach to that. Um, unfortunately, I wish that, but posology is definitely one of the most challenging things, I think, in homeopathy. That and the second prescription, you know, when your first prescription falls flat. <laughs> kind of yeah. going back and, and looking, what did I miss? Um, why isn't this person responding to the remedy? What am I going to prescribe next? And, and I'm definitely, there's going to be some cases in my, my autism uh, course that, that we're going to explore that. What do we do when the first remedy doesn't work? Um, and just to add on to that a little bit, when, when I was mentioning you know, I've really kind of come full circle almost in some ways where I'm really kind of, you know, and I've studied uh, Massimo's work and I've studied uh, Sankran's work and, and I've learned a lot from, from studying the sensation met method, for example, but I've really come back to a much simpler, straightforward way of, of practicing these days where I really am just looking for the similimum. I'm really just looking for like here's like and and trying to actually relieve my mind of some of those theories and even miasms or 
getting too fixated on the sensation method and going way out on a limb with a really obscure remedy. Because what I've learned the hard way in watching practitioners that have used the sensation method is that once you've prescribed a really far out remedy and it doesn't work, it sometimes is really difficult once you've gone so far out on that limb to come back to a second prescription. But if you're taking a case in a really straightforward way where you're simply looking for what's strange, rare, and peculiar in the case, <laughs> and unique and characteristic, it's much easier to come back to a second prescription from that place because you've got the lay of the land and your interview hasn't, you know, detoured really far afield with the sensation approach and gone out on this limb of, you know, looking at a, a you know, hopefully it's the nexus of what you're treating, but, but sometimes um, I've seen practitioners get really far out with, with a really obscure remedy, and it's hard to come back to center from that point and treat. Um, Lauren, do you want to add anything about that? Do you? Um, no, I, I, well, I totally agree. I, I love how you just said it beautifully. And, and again, in this um, foundational curriculum that we've developed, it just takes you through those processes. And I really think that this curriculum is, should be the foundation for every program, every course in, the, in homeopathy. Yeah. But to, to, um, to just say a little bit about what we see in, in Haiti also. I mean, sometimes we don't, we don't have all the potencies. We don't have all the medicines. And, you know, as long as you give, I mean, obviously you're always looking for this minimum, but as long as you give something that's in the right church, maybe not the right pew, you see something happen. These people are not unconventional medicines because they can't afford them. They don't have surgery. It's because they can't afford them and there's not enough practitioners to do the procedures. Um, minimally vaccinated. Um, seeing more and more young babies now vaccinated, but most of the older children, people are not vaccinated. So they're pretty much a clean slate. And the medicines, the homeopathic medicines work quickly and swiftly and beautifully. Um, you get your answer really quick. And, and in the same way that they present the, the totality, the, the medicine picture very clearly. Um, they just, even though their lives are very different than ours, they are struggling every day to find clean food, clean water, sometimes a place to sleep. Um, 80, well, what is it now? 74% unemployment rate, you know, and the, their currency keeps going down and down. Even while I'm there, it goes down. Um, and, you know, they are poorer than poor and yet, and struggle every day with survival. Um, but I hope you got in some of those pictures that they, they do have hope and they do have um, a, an inner spirit that guides them. And their vital force is right there, and it responds really quickly. It hasn't been suppressed as much as exactly. a lot of the patients here in exactly. the United States. Do you yeah. find, just in your practice, that the liquid dosing seems to work a little bit better than the dry dosing? Um, it depends, because we're very careful. We usually try to just give out one dose at the clinics, because... Um, First of all, it's not gonna, they're gonna probably lose it. It's not gonna stay uncontaminated. And they may even just give it to their neighbor or their daughter or their, their sister because they have the same thing too. You know, um, so you never know where that next dose is gonna go. So we're very, very careful. During the epidemics, we used it in water. Matter of fact, we um, atomized um, as a, uh, preventive in the, the communities that were going out were hard hit by the hurricane and were very at risk for cholera. And we just atomized everybody. We just went right down the rows, <laughs> had people line up. Um, and then sometimes, it depends, but we will give people 
um, if we can get a hold of a clean bottle of water and put the medicine in and teach them how to shake it, you know, and go off. So we do do it. It depends on the the the, um, the condition, patient themselves, um, and whether we're going to be around long enough to follow them up. To. But we do have follow-up, even if we don't eyeball them ourselves. There's um, the Haitian homeopaths follow patients up. Um, we follow every infectious disease up in three days with either a phone call or a visit if necessary, and then again in eight days. So they're followed up. And then some people who I want to hear from them even sooner than three days, we follow up. Anything else? You know, I, I just, yeah. as you were talking, I, um, I, uh, I've been interviewing, part of my, my role at Home Pass Without Borders is that I've been interviewing and videotaping the volunteers returning. And one of the questions that I ask, um, you know, the Haitians, my sense, and, you know, there was a, there was a great uh, New York Times article that was written about this, but they are an incredibly resilient culture that considering yeah. what they've been through, um, you know, and every volunteer that I've, I've interviewed has, has uh, reaffirmed that, that there's something in the culture that they, they're willing to help out each other, they're, they're, they're kind to each other, they're supportive. There's something like in the, in, in the face of so much um, tragedy and these, the earthquakes and that just devastation that somehow there's, there's this, there's a vitality there. And it just, as Lauren, as you were speaking, I, I was thinking about how, you know, vitality, um, there's probably some overlap with resilience in that, in that regard, that the more resilient a person is, the stronger their vitality is, if yeah. you can think about it that way. And so, and I think this is part of why, you know, sometimes when you go to a place like Mumbai or to Haiti, um, there's such, they, their, vital, their, vital, their vital forces respond to home, homeopathic remedies more quickly. Um, and I don't know if that's, you know, when you're working on a subsistence level and just trying to get through the day Definitely. and we don't have all these overlays that we have. And, you know, like I, some, I had a professor in, in naturopathic school um, who would talk about the United States and other so-called first world countries as overdeveloped countries mm -hmm. um, as opposed to underdeveloped, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a, we are overdeveloped in a sense that's detrimental, yep. both to our health, our health and to our level of resilience in general. Yeah. And I think that that takes its toll on our vitality. So it is, I think in some ways it is more complicated treating people in, in this country because there's so many overlays of overdevelopment and it's more difficult. Yep. Yep. That way. Mm -hmm. yep. I agree. Well, so come and join us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I hope I hope to see some of you in March on the ninth uh, for this autism uh, course that I'm going to teach. It will be we'll dive in a lot deeper to some of this material, and and I look forward to seeing some of you. If not all. What, were, what were the other dates? Yeah. Um, so it's the second Saturday at oh. 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, so 11 o'clock Mountain time, and what one o'clock. Um, East Coast time, so second Saturday, March, April, and May, uh, March 9th, April 13th, and May 11th, second Saturdays. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much yeah. for coming out on a Saturday morning to hear Lauren and, and me. Yeah.